and a week ago was the beginning. <laughs> now is the knowing. <laughs> So it's worth, you know, investigating the perceptions of time because uh, time is, uh, you know, our societies are very much regard that as time as real. And so we have clocks and calendars and uh, we live our lives in this, in the thoroughly committed to time as reality. But when you investigate time uh, as uh, experience, isn't it? It's the past is a memory, the future is the unknown, now is the knowing. So when reflecting on this, it, it helps to 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 break down the the uh, illusion that we usually operate from around ourselves as being time-bound creature born 70 years ago will die sometime in the next 20 years and <laughs> now I'm breathing <laughs> conscious and breathing and sitting <clears throat> So, like vipassana practice is uh, is uh, looking into the nature of things. It's insight uh, practice. So, it, it's investigation, examining. So, you know, like uh, memory. So that we, you know, we have retentive memory, so we can remember our past, and we have. You know, we we have language and we have memory, and so memories are is, can be just taken for granted, and so our past can be quite quite real for us. When in the reality, uh, whatever you remember is always in the present, and when you really look at a memory as experience, there's nothing much to it, is it? It's very uh, fleeting, there's no core, no essence, no substance, comes and goes. If we lose our memory, then we, then what happens? So memory is very conditioned, isn't it? We can lose memories, we, we, we get older, we can't remember some certain things that we used to be able to. We have senior moments, as they so nicely put it, and uh, oh, a big fear of getting that every time I have a senior moment, I think, oh, here comes Alzheimer's. Because <laughs> that's the, the, you know, the thing none of us want at all, is to, is to uh, be an old person with Alzheimer's, where you, you don't remember anything. But that might be quite nice, actually. <laughs> In uh, the bringing back the, the retreat situation is a special situation, it's a set up, isn't it? So, you know, it's a, a special event, it's not daily life practice. So, recognize that, that, the, that retreats are set up, retreat center, uh, and everything is uh, organized and set up in a way that, that um, <coughs> you can just con do a lot of concentration and reflection because you don't have anything else to do. 
so it's you know it's it's meant to be uh, skillful means and an, and a help. But then the the problem always uh, comes up. What how do we what do we do when we leave the retreat? When we go back home, <laughs> because uh, home is you know what we're used to. It's and uh, we can't make our families and force everybody around us to keep noble silence and to organize their lives so that we can live like we do on a retreat. So it's like Sati Sampatanya is being aware of time and place. It's our ability to to bring into our consciousness the way things are in terms of the the people we're with, the the situation we're in, the the time, the 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 country, the culture, the uh, things we have to do to survive, our profession, our work. <coughs> so the idealist then wants to, you know, they get you can get addicted to retreats and then then complain about life because you can't you can't uh, get the tranquil state or the you have too many kind of disruptive things occurring in your life and feel uh, you know feel and comparing it to retreat situation you you feel uh, you can complain about it but the re- say the retreat situation is is not meant to you're not sp- meant to uh, cling to it or idealize it it's it's merely a, a, a helpful tool to encourage and uh, inspire encourage and give us some some uh, experience that we can integrate into daily life like mindfulness is uh, isn't dependent on any conditions whatsoever <coughs> It's not a, where samadhi, getting a really high level of samadhi does depend on conditions being supportive, where mindfulness doesn't. Now this is, this is the, the real essence of, of uh, practice, is, is recognizing, realizing mindfulness. So during this retreat, that's what I've been, do you know, as you can tell I've just been repeating over and over again the the what mindfulness really is how to you know to to learn to trust it to appreciate it it's a blessing it's uh, it's the way out of it's the way to be liberated from delusion from suffering so the that mindfulness then is the path itself Aparuta de Sangamatasa Taura. Mindfulness is the path, it's the way to the deathless. And when I chant Aparuta de Sangamatasa Taura, this is the, the gates to the deathless are open. So that that is the gates to the deathless is mindfulness. Just that, just here and now. Uh, bringing attention, being receptive to the way it is. <coughs> so that includes time, place, uh, the state of mind you're in, the physical condition you're experiencing, the everything that's here and now. You know, so it's not a whether you're here at retreat center, at home, or uh, in a monastery, or in a battlefield, or whatever. Uh, it's always here and now. So that's where, you know, the recognizing or realizing that is is uh, to be encouraged, because you, you can you you know you you think you might know what it is because you you understand the concept. But that people can, uh, you know, 
grasp the idea of mindfulness, but mindfulness is just merely this. And it's, uh, it's nothing much. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have any worth at all. You can't sell it. And, uh, and it doesn't seem like anything in, to the uh, conditioned way of thinking, worldly values. So it might be worthless, but it is priceless. So the the gate to the deathless is always now. And then ye soda vanta bamunjan tu satang. Ye soda vanta, those who listen, who pay attention, those who hear, those who pay attention. Trust in this. Satang, faith, or trust. And this is, uh, I always like this because it's, uh, you know, it's a pointing to the, the gate to the deathless is open for those who pay attention. Mm. So during this retreat, just pointing to the the sakya ditti, the sense of self, personality, what we take for granted, uh, is as you know we we operate in the in these delusions of I am the body, I am Ajahn Sumedho, I am this uh, I'm American, and so forth. These are these seem quite uh, you know they seem like facts and statistics and that that. Uh, that I can define myself with. But when I really look at any of that, any sense of myself as being, having any quality, condition, uh, anything, it, when you really look at it with awareness, it, it, ha- it has no, nothing to it. So then, then the mind will say, well then I'm nobody. And then we we think that we're just sitting here trying to to destroy ourselves <laughs> the kind of maybe Buddhism is maybe a kind of mental suicide we just sit here eventually there's nothing left and we just an empty hulk and they say who are you I don't, I don't know anymore <laughs> and they say Ajahn Samino they say, who's that <laughs> and you say, oh, he's got Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's not an attack on 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 the conditioned phenomena on the five khandas. It's not trying. It's not annihilation or a put down, but putting them in perspective of what they really are, in terms of Dhamma, the way it really is, rather than the way we assume it is, or believe it is, or think it is. There's always, I find it always very kind of relief to realize everything I think I am is not really mine. You know, no matter what I think I am, it's not what I am. And I always like that, you know, because um, sometimes we don't think so well of ourselves, or even if we do think we're we're the the absolute best, it's still, you know, one doesn't, you know, find that any great comfort either. And when we the sakyaditi, when we don't understand it, then we we do. We always, you know, we worry. We we were we have endless problems with relationships, with work, with family, with you name it. We're creating endless conflicts and problems around these uh, delusions we hold to. So the aim of vipassana is to is to see what we're doing, the the clinging out of ignorance that we cling to to the unreal as real.
and then we create endless conflicts in our minds or with others. So the state of the world, isn't it, is, is one where people are operating from fixed positions, good against evil. The axis of evil is is over. That's not in the United States or in Britain, is it? It's in. <laughs> over there <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, you know these are people really believe this and, and act on it and, and uh, the Iraq war was a, was a real exercise in delusion you know an enormous amount of, of uh, you know technology and fantastic weaponry was aimed at one country, all trying to get rid of one person, Saddam Hussein, he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people, you know, died in the process? But that's what delusion, the nature of delusion does, you know, it, it, it blinds us, we, we have no perspective of time and place. Uh, understanding of the way it is is not part of that, isn't it? Or we have we form an opinion, a bias uh, that we have an enemy, and then we we try to destroy the enemy, and we don't know what we're doing. We don't even know who the enemy is actually, because we create you know these kind of illusions. <coughs> and then we draw millions of people into the into this delusion <laughs> and uh, and so the world is like what it is and we hear the the news and uh, we wonder why why we can't why we can't establish peace why doesn't why doesn't isn't the united nations what 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 is it doing and and why can't we just uh, agree and and find ways of living peace for each other is an that's an ideal, isn't it? That would be nice. We'd like that. We think we'd like that anyway. Uh, and we, you know, we would like to see the end of war. But as long as there's delusion, then it's, uh, it's just inevitable, you know. As, as long as, as I'm deluded, uh, and I make no effort, and I just go along with the same... Uh, assumptions and same delusions as everyone else then you know why do I complain about it you know th because you know I think if I if I'm still deluded then why should I expect Tony Blair to be enlightened or George Bush or complain about them because they are <laughs> so so then you you get down to the to the reality of I can I have very no ability I don't I've never met Tony Blair so I don't he's not uh, you know he's not particularly one that would visit a Buddhist monastery <laughs> even though he doesn't live far away from here <laughs> not much chance to meet him or if he did uh, if we did meet he probably wouldn't believe anything I said anyway so but I can do it from here, you know. This is this is the reality. I can I can do it myself. Whether it affects others, you know. Hopefully, it does. Like this retreat is uh, coming together and sharing uh, what I've learned in my own practice with you is one way of trying to encourage you. But I can't make you enlightened. You know, there's no way I can kind of make you do it or or convince you it's a it's the sharing the teachings isn't it dhamma teachings is more or less an encouragement a pointing and that's the best we can do for others with ourselves we can actually get down to the very cause of suffering and the the uh, cessation of suffering and recognize, realize the way of non-suffering in terms of uh, this 
this being here. Suffering then, cessation of suffering is, is to be realized. The causes of suffering are to be let go of, and the cessation of suffering is to be realized, recognized. So the word realization is about reality, seeing the reality of that suffering in terms of you know, the nature of phenomena is very nature is arising, ceasing. And awareness is our ability to notice, to recognize, to see the, uh, to notice that, to be aware that all conditioned phenomena, the base and kara, is impermanent. So, rather than grasp the idea, Buddhist ideas, we're putting them into to test them out, you know, to to, to know directly rather than through uh, just believing what the Buddha said. So the cessation of suffering uh, is to be realized, each one for themselves. So that's why I, I you know, I've been uh, emphasizing this the awareness, mindfulness, where you begin to to be more confident. You're really conscious. Awareness with consciousness. And with consciousness then where consciousness is is here and now. And awareness is bringing attention to here and now. And, and attention first to the the obvious, the the desires that we have that come and go. So, uh, by bringing attention to the obvious, to the conditions, to the body, physical body, to the uh, emotional uh, conditions we're experiencing, to thinking itself, then that awareness. Uh, puts us in touch with it in terms of of um, its presence and its absence. So we, I notice when 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 it's absent or when there's non-attachment, there's a, the awareness is still is the constant factor. Isn't it? It's a, it has a continuity, a stability, where the condition itself comes and goes according to other conditions. So pointing to the sound of silence is a reference to to get to notice because then that is that has a con- continuity when we recognize know that it is uh, puts us in relationship to the five khandhas in terms of seeing them uh, as anicca and anatta reflecting on on the, these two characteristics of anicca and anatta so the the pure awareness doesn't have isn't as as no personal quality it's just this it's not Ajahn Sameto being aware. And it, it has no, you know, it has no, you can't, uh, the reason why you, you can't is worthless because, you know, and it, it, you can't put it out and sell it to anyone. <laughs> you can't, you can't find it. You, you have to recognize it. So it's not something that that you get and and then can can hold on to, but it's it's <coughs> when you give up trying to hold on to anything, letting go, that you uh, really are in touch with the way it is. 
all conditions are impermanent. And so applying that the, in this in that uh, flowing, continuous flowing of the sound of silence, and it's a one can reflect on thought, the nature of thought arising, ceasing, of of emotion, of feelings of love and hate, of like and dislike, of desire to get something, desire to get rid of things. What there is there is a perspective on that, on dunha, desire, because it, it arises and it ceases. To be able to recognize dunha is, you know, to, is just, you have to trust your own, the, the reality of, of, of knowing. Dunha is like this, desire is like this. And as you rest in the awareness of it, then you see it, it is a, a changing condition. There's no such thing as permanent desire. And yet you conceive yourself on a Sakya Ditti level as someone that always has a lot of desires. And the, the personality, is, we kind of fix ourselves with these perceptions. I'm someone with a lot of gamadanha, sensual desire, or I'm a I'm a real whippawa dunha type, you know, wanting to get rid of things. I'm a suppressor, an annihilator, a terminator. <laughs> the terminator is now governor of California. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> scary. <laughs> I think he believes it, you know. <clears throat> On a in a spiritual quest, then you know, like the the nature of God or ultimate reality. Uh, the deathless, uh, all these, these terms convey this, uh, uh, an innate sense that there's something beyond just the conditioned realm, isn't there? I mean, when, when people, uh, when Christians talk about God, it's, you know, they say, well, what, can you prove it? You know, is, can you show me? And, and we want, we want, you know, through conditioned phenomena to grasp God as as being something that you can prove in in a way that is a condition that you can you know everybody a scientist and we all could see this is God and and uh, then I believe it but uh, nobody can do that you know so then they assume there isn't any but in uh, the human heart, well, no matter what, whether they, you know, how, you know, they're tribal or, or Western civilization or traditional societies, whatever, there's always this, this uh, sense of the sacred, of something beyond just the, the uh, conditioned realm that is, that is what we identify with. So when we, uh, you know this, this this sense of there's something more, there's something else than just me as a personality, me as a, as a, this character here, and that is an intuitive sense. You know, it's not it's not rational. It's not just rationalized. If I rationalize it, I end up usually thinking there isn't anything because that's how rationality works. But, and especially if you're just operating from condition level of thinking. Now notice the paradigm in, in the Buddhist context is the relationship of the unconditioned to the conditioned. So it, it's, it's not just there's only conditioned phenomena and it's impermanent suffering and, and not self. 
then it then it that then the logic that of grasping that image would be annihilation. You know, there's no point in doing anything really, uh, because uh, if everything is impermanent and suffering, and everything ends anyway, and it ceases and it's gone forever, then you know why bother to come to a retreat, or why not just eat, drink, be merry, and have a good time? Is the logic of of, uh, of that way of thinking? But intuitively, isn't it? There's uh, there's a recognition, a sense beyond the senses, and this is a. Uh, and some, you know, sometimes people don't recognize it, and they'll settle for, for just the material experience. But um, many of us are interested in in just, ha- uh, you know, eating, drinking, having a good time. Uh, we see, see that that uh, is very unsatisfactory too. It's not that I have never enjoyed those things, but. But it certainly, uh, you know, is not a way of being liberated. So then, this this inner sense, uh, this awareness, this awakening sense, or this intuitive intuition is a, is beyond the senses, and this is what we we call sati. Sati Sampachanya. So through awareness, through mindfulness, we actually touch into that, into the deathless. The gate to the deathless is open. Now, you know, that's the only possible way it can be. You know, if there's no, if you can't, if there's, if, if the deathless is it's just an abstract idea or you know some metaphysical theory or um, it's an object well then it, it doesn't work because then we get into arguments you know taking sides and forming views and opinions so it has it can only be in the immediacy of awareness here and now because that's the only possible gate to the deathless because as soon as you try to find another one, you've already conceived it as something you, you know, and you're, you know, or you, you know, you're thinking about it. You're grasping an idea. You're believing in somebody else's idea, maybe. But the awareness is is then our ability. Each one of us has this innate ability, and it's a b- great blessing. Through just this sim- simple ability to pay attention to life as we experience it, attention not in terms of you know criticizing or picking and choosing from from all the conditioned experiences we're having, but in noticing that when we're really attentive, paying attention, then uh, you know the we can recognize the way it is, that all conditions are this way. And whether they're, you know, a good, bad, indifferent, wanted, unwanted, angelic or hellish or whatever, condition phenomena is very, we're now looking at it in terms of, of Dhamma rather than in terms of preference. So that's why the encouragement to trust this, to to get to really know this, and and this is a, this is something to hold, it's something sacred, it's something, it's a blessing, it's a it's a, a gift we have, and within incarcerated in these limited forms as human beings. You know, and many when and when I think of it, it seems almost hopeless on a personal level. 
you know, when I personally get caught in my personality and try to think about it all, it, it, uh, it usually takes me to despair. But when, when I stop that, stop grasping the, the personality and the, the thinking habits and the logic and reason and the emotional experiences, when I let go of that, then there is this this awareness. It seems like nothing in, in when you try to describe it. So, like as I said before, awareness is formless. That's why you can't get it. You can't see it. You can't uh, feel it you know, as something. And so it has. It needs to be recognized as just this simple, imminent attention here and now. And so I, uh, sharing my my experiences with listening to sound of silence. I don't want to make sound of silence as some kind of the deathless. Then you'll grasp the. You'll put that perception onto it. You know, Ajahn Tomato says, sound of silence is the deathless. And then, then you'll create some kind of thing around that. And that's not what I'm, you know, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm pointing to it, uh, you know, to, for you to recognize, to notice it. Because even though people not have that, they don't generally know what it is. They don't notice it. And even meditators, you know, people who have done a lot of meditation, uh, they they don't know what it is. So I know some people I know in the United States. I was, I was talking about it, and they said, "Oh, we 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 know that, yeah." But we just have to label it as just sound, sound, and try to get rid of it, let go of it. <laughs> because uh, they're attached to some method about labeling things, and then, and you've just and then, so by labeling it, it's supposed to go away. Well, does it? You know, you can distract yourself from it by going to something else. But if you really recognize it, and 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 to recognize it is not to grasp it, is it? It's it's not that you can't grasp it. You can you can recognize it, notice it, and it and it is like the background of everything. It, you can you, you you can even listen to music, and it's in the background of all music. It's where things are where you know sounds other sounds arise and cease, and it doesn't destroy any sound. It doesn't, you know, uh, in, in fact, it enhances music. You know, if you listen to, I think in, in Indian music, it's a kind of basis for it. Because it, it's, you know, it's, it's it, it, I can't even call it a sound. It's, it kind of seems like one to me. The vib- vibration or whatever way you want to describe it, the important thing is to recognize it, to notice it, because it doesn't, it, it do, you know, it doesn't come out and uh, demand attention. It stays in the background until you really begin to recognize it. Where your thoughts and emotions can, you know, come up and take you over. Greed, hatred, and delusion, and their various permutations can completely dominate your experience your whole life. And you live in a whole, you know, in, a, in an emotional turmoil, in states of madness <coughs> and depression. These are common, you know, in, in in society, aren't they? People just live in alcoholic stupors or drug states or with just crazy perceptions, the attachments to kind of obsessive fears and so forth that that just dominate conscious experience. So 
So, you know, being totally deluded, or people tend to just never question life. They just take the accepted conventional version and go along with it. But uh, in this, in the Buddha's teaching of awakening, isn't it? the wake up teaching, point is a, it's an invitation to wake up. And that waking up then is it's here and now. It's about here and now. And and reflecting, noticing. So in in uh, practice, you know, starting from this sound of silence, I can bring attention to the body, like this morning is going through this through the the experience, the, the posture, the sitting posture, the sensations, the breath. I can bring a, awareness to the mood or the the mental state I'm in, because the, you know just noticing what kind of um, uh, mood I happen to be experiencing right now. You know, I can be in this stillness, this sound of silence, and notice that you know what kind of uh, quality of emotion that's present. So it's transcending the emotion, isn't it? Or the or the thought or the body, because it all is in this awareness. The body is in the awareness. The breath is in the awareness. The mood is in the awareness. The thoughts. All that arises, ceases, all that, all conditioned phenomena is then received in this awareness. So that is the the gate to, to the deathless. Now when we talk about deathless, now that is, is it in the negation of death? <laughs> and uh, and death itself is uh, you know what we identify with. Isn't it? You identify with your body this body is mine, I'm the body, then where's it going? It's going to death. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, that's where it, it, you can't, you know, that's its nature. It's a thing, it's a condition that arises, has its span and, and dies. Or before the body dies, you know, you see the cessation of a phenomena in your mind. You know, so birth and death are usually um, about the, the physical body, but then beginning and ending are around uh, conditioned phenomena, thoughts and emotions, sensations, pleasure and pain, sensory impingement, sensory contact. All this is, you know, is this beginning and ending. So whether you call it an ending or you call it death, it's a, it's about cessation, that which is arises ceases. And the, the the deathless awareness then recognizes the arising and ceasing. After after a thought or an emotion ceases, there's still consciousness and awareness operating, isn't it? So it's in awakening and, and, and confirming this. May, it usually we don't notice because we, we, we tend to, to only notice what we, what we perceive, what we're conditioned to, to notice. And so like, like exercises, and I used to have a practice in, when, uh, in my early years in, in Thailand because uh, sitting with a group of monks, and and I kept thinking, you know, that this monk, he's like this, this monk like that, that monk's this way. It's a senior monk, junior monk. I like that monk; he's a good one. That one I don't care much for. And so that even though we're all monks, you know, shaven heads, ochre robes, and so forth, 
we still create each other endlessly in terms of, uh, you know, appearance and uh, whether they're tall or short, fat or thin, whether we like them or don't, whether we agree with them or disagree. And so we create personalities in in each other and we give a lot of importance to to the way we perceive each other uh, on a personal level. Now the the aim of uh, of monastic, Buddhist monasticism is just shave the head, wear the same things. Uh, nuns shave their heads, wear similar robes, and and it's to kind of take away the the kind of unique personal qualities that we would maybe display if we had you know if we could fix our hair the way we liked it or we wore what we were in the mood for and you know, express my personality. Uh, and each one would wear uh, fashion according to their personality. Then we keep reinforcing this. But even with the with the conformity of Buddhist monasticism, we still do it. And it's like like uh, giving Pali names. Remember when when I named after Ajahn Anando died, I named uh, another monk, Gary Thompson. I named him Ananda. Some people found that very d- upsetting because they personified Ananda with one monk as a person. And the point is that now there's Sister Sumaita. I named her myself. <laughs> Some people find that, you know. Sumaita is Ajahn Sumaita, you know. And it, it, it's kind of challenging. But this, is a, this isn't a personal name. You know, and that we can make it into personality, and that's it. But that we want to see that, that we create that personality around a name. A monk that has a bad reputation, then his name is, you don't want to name anybody that. <laughs> you wouldn't dare, dare name any monk Devadatta, would we? <laughs> <laughs> But then in the practice of just noticing the spaces between monks, I just, I used to concentrate on the spaces between the monks rather than be, you know, be so fixated on this monk and this one and that one. And because this, uh, this is a very obvious fact, reality, there's space between people, isn't there? And it's, you can see it, I can see it, I can see the space right here. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and so it's a different. It's a, a kind of upai or skillful means to notice something that's present that generally we don't bother to notice because of the commitment to the material world or the conditioned world as reality. But it gives a very different way of looking at something if you if you start consciously noticing space, space between space around rather than the the object itself. Well apply that to mental experience. You know, if if one's attached to thinking then you just go on and on and on and, and then you you know just one thought goes on to the next. But if you notice before thought, like the exercise we're doing with uh you know, I am Ajahn Sumato before before I uh, before you think. After I am, then there's space between am and Ajahn, then there's space between Ajahn and Sumato, and then there's then there's big space, big gap there. Now that's just that might sound like uh, what's the point of that, but it's it, it, that awareness, then you're you're developing a continuity in awareness. You're not just aware of this object, but of the the, the continuum where the object is present and absent. And that's consciously done. It's in consciousness.
I just reflect that that the real world, the most people is is uh, is just this. This is reality. The, this is reality. It's it's always perceiving something or other, some form, some conditioned thing, some object, and and that and the space around it is never noticed, never consciously observed. So in in uh, vipassana meditation, you're you're making this a practice of, of awareness of space or the gaps between thoughts or the uh, presence of desire and when it ceases. So that and, and so this is this is the, the where we have this gate to the deathless because this is this is the the conditions arise and cease born and die but the awareness is the is the gate to the deathless so recognize that that birth and death are a pair isn't it? the birth you have death now i used to associate life with the death a life it's a matter of life and death and 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 so life is is uh is you you know i would assume would mean condition phenomena it's alive and uh, and then when we kill it it's no longer alive and that's generally accepted way of speaking but now i i think you know i realize the buddha was pointing to birth and death you know the beginning, how something begins, arises, and then ceases. And life then isn't uh, isn't something that arises and ceases. This is just a reflection, not a not a philosophical statement. This for consideration. Or the deathless. Life is sounds too much like something deathless, or the unconditioned. Now the the eightfold path or the the way the practice is the pavana. It should be cultivated or developed. And then the eightfold path is usually you know, samaditi, sama sangapo, sama vaja, sama gamanto, sama jivo, sama vayamu, sama sati, sama samadhi. That sounds very complicated, doesn't it? And <laughs> and. Uh, because it's uh, you know it's, you think this is a path, and then the, then the logical mind was in first you have to have some and we we think of it in 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 that linear programming of one thing and then the next and then the next because that's the nature of thinking. You can't think A B at the same time. Think A then B. Try thinking A B at the same moment. <laughs> But you can intuit A, B, C in one. I can anyway. If I don't think them, that that because it's it's in in awareness rather than than fixed into a thought process, a thinking pattern. So so awareness then it brings us to sama. Ditti, right, right understanding, right view, or sometimes uh, uh, right is is uh, it, sometimes it can be questioned. But some people translate perfect understanding. In the English word, you can play with with either one. You can find a better one. That's all right. But the point is that. <coughs> the right view or samaditi is is uh, the awareness. It's not a it's not a, a viewpoint or a, a doctrinal position. It's a recognition uh, where the confidence in awareness uh, is is there. From this point, 
of awakened attention, awakened awareness. Then, then um, from there it moves into, you know, how we relate to the conditioned world we're experiencing, which is uh, in, through intention and through speech and uh, action, livelihood, uh, effort, mindfulness, concentration. So from this, uh, this um, like the the uh, last three, why sama, why ama, sama, sati, sama, samadhi are are about emotional balance, upeka, a balance of 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 effort with concentration, where there's a you know they're they're not uh, you know there's a a oneness, a wholeness there. And so the and and right speech, right action, right livelihood is just like you know once there's the right right understanding, then we we take on. We want to use our lives, our remain of our lives, how we live our lives in the in the family and in the society in a way that is uh, morally right. You know to use it for for good communication for speech that is that is you know appropriate to to communicate to be able to talk to each other to uh, say things to each other adequately without you know coming from some personal prejudice or trying to influence people out of you know out of some biased view desire to convert or convince or dominate or right action how we you know, because we have physical bodies we have to live in this world we have to move and and bodies can be used for all kinds of horrible things as we well know so we we have to use our bodies not we're trying to use the the body for in, in a way that is Beneficial, kind, uh, compassionate, and uh, right livelihood to make our living a way we live in a way that isn't uh, um, something we regret or is harmful to ourselves or others. So this this is called eightfold path, but it. But it's really based on samaditi, the insight into the path. The path is the awareness, and that awareness is, you know, because it's here and now and it's timeless. Then it, then it's not, uh, it's not really a path. But <laughs> in the in the conventional sense of the word path, it's not, it's not going from here to there. It's always here. <laughs> But cultivating our pawana, then in establishing that, in apply, integrating that into our daily lives. So this is the challenge for you when you uh, at the when you leave the Amaravati retreat center to go home. Then you know you've got the ability to to um, use awareness and, and integrate that into the flow of your life. Really trust yourself to to really notice what you're doing. What, not in a critical way. Not to, you know to to make yourself feel guilty or create endless doubts about things. But to to notice what you know how you how you relate to others or the, what you're feeling, and not to just make, allow it to be consciously received with that. Once you put it, a judgment onto it, then it becomes more than that. And like say, if if anger arises, so, so, like uh, somebody says something, I feel anger arising. In awareness, if there's awareness, I can feel the anger arising. And I say that's anger. Then it's more than what it is. 
You see what I mean? You're putting something onto it from your, you're saying it's anger when it is what it is. So in, in terms of uh, panya or wisdom, it isn't labeling and, 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 and because in labeling is always, it's, this is a function of the mind that compounds and makes something more than what it is. So, so it's learning to receive this. And there's a discerning ability. You know, so with Samma Waja, Samma Gamanta, Samma Tivo, right speech, right action, right livelihood, where there's a spontaneity of response that come from Panya, from wisdom, rather than kind of moral judgments and endless doubts and quibbling around right and wrong, good and evil. <coughs> does take patience though because the, the tendency to to think about it and to label things is so strong the kind of oh that's anger my anger and, and things like that or uh, you know and, and words we do live we do regard words concepts as real so that's where it's real you know in, in investigating in, in the Jitanu Pasana and that we're really looking at the way it is. You know, words are created by us. We project words onto the onto the condition itself. And and to see that. And then, we, we, then once we see that that's not necessary, that there's the panya faculty is is our refuge, not the not the critical one that 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 labels and judges make comparisons and has views and opinions. So it is a it's going against the whole cultural conditioning we have <laughs> and uh, and the delusions of the world that w- the society that we live in. But it, and so it 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 uh, that's where meditation retreats help, monasteries, Buddhist centers meditation groups, uh, Buddha images, anything like this, you know, is to, you know, helps to remind us because it's so easy to, to, to be pulled back into the crazy world. So in this, so you're willing to trust this in yourself, recognize it, realize it, and trust it. Then that will then 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 the path becomes very clear, the eightfold path instead of being kind of eightfold, some are this and some are that, it, it simplifies into the moment of awareness, and that is uh, integrating into the flow of experience that we have throughout the day and night. So. I uh, offer this as a reflection, uh, and uh, now uh, I en- encourage you to go back to noble silence for the remainder of the time until you take the five precepts tomorrow morning. So that you had your time to chat, and you notice what that does to the mind? <laughs> and now. Now I encourage you to uh, to reassume the take the noble silence and uh, and to take advantage of the short time we have left. Mm-hmm.